Hello. Oh, that's good. Working. <laughs> cool. Let's get this show on the road. There is a contagious epidemic sweeping the nation. It's not just in our cities or our workplaces or even our homes. It's in our hands. It's taken over my life. Once you start, you can't stop. I don't know who I am anymore. Most people think best fiends won't happen to them, that it's simply harmless fun. Thought I could just try it once. But soon, it becomes an obsession. I wouldn't say that I'm obsessed. <laughs> I'm spirited, passionate. That's what's going on here. Some people, we can help. Doc says I may never use my thumbs again. You always think it'll happen to someone else's family. Look what it did to our Billy. Others require more specialized treatment. I have finally beaten level 256. I'm a YouTube star. Of course you are. Start by recognizing the warning signs. Tiredness, gamer's thumbs, <laughs> night terrors, and sweaty eyes. It's so hot. In just seconds, anyone can be playing Best Fiends. After all, it's free to download from the App Store and Google Play. It took me about a month to done it. <laughs> a one click and you may have begun an obsession you can't stop. Oh, hey, Mom. No. Mm -hmm. I was just talking about best fiends. Oh. oh, no, 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 no. I'm a doctor. Of course you are, Miss Walsh. Let's get you into bed. I'm Dr. Lisa Richards. I'm so sorry. Right now, there is no cure for best fiends. My advice, do not download best fiends. Not once, not ever. The world will be a better place for it. <laughs> Look, we got it. Worst case of best fiends I've ever seen. Remember when she used to be a doctor on TV? I still am! Yeah, so <clears throat> don't, don't download best fiends. No, don't do it. Uh, hello, everyone. Nice to be here. Uh, I'm Reko Ko. I'm the VP of game design at Seriously. Uh, I've been a game designer for 15 years across all kinds of different platforms, mobile, PC, console, what have you. I, I still say that my biggest claim to fame is the uh, above the best fiends logo you see a Finnish ATM. So if you have a, ever happen to be in Helsinki and you're trying to withdraw money out of the ATM, uh, I, I made that. But if your saldo is zero, it's not my fault. So that's that's we, that's all settled. Uh, yeah. So I have a fairly big presentation about all kinds of things. Uh, mostly this deals with uh, finding a game studio, building your first uh, IP, how, how do you kind of go about doing it, how do you do creative marketing in the mobile space, how do you work with some really creative afterburners that help you on your goals. So uh, let's, let's get to it. So we found it seriously uh, early, uh, or actually August 2013, and we were kind of thinking like, how do we, how do we face this thing? And we, we essentially, our belief is that the next generation of uh, entertainment brands is built on mobile. Because if you look at the regular family, you have family of four, there might be uh, one PC there, but there is bound to be four mobile devices there. So it's just a pair of eyes that you get, that's, that's huge. So for us, 
it's all about the brand and currently the apps are the platform for the internet intellectual property. So back in the day it might have been a movie and it was, but currently we believe that all the biggest brands, new brands will appear on a mobile first and that means on apps first. So our like we, we, we wanted to like how can we distill all of this into a one phrase and that phrase ended up being if Walt Disney would find uh, Disney today, where would he start? And that would be games. So that's, that's how we kind of went about with it. So seriously is currently two offices. So uh, we have uh, about 60 people and we have the sunny, warm, hospitable, not cold at all, uh, Helsinki. And then we have the miserable, drudgy, rainy, traffic infested hotspot called Los Angeles. So I, I feel really bad for those guys, like it's, that heat is going to be, it's, it's, it's hard. Uh, so everyone always, uh, let's see, what did I, yeah, so the way we kind of, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of people who've been around the block in the game industry for a long time. So the series is so-called second time startup in the Helsinki startup lingo, which means that most of the people there have already uh, built up one company and kind of gone past that. So we have, we have the, some of the founders of Remedy Entertainment, for example, uh, who, who found it seriously. And we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking like, how can we kind of, how can we build the company in a way that we, we get people that are really good fit for not just the best things the game, but also the company culture. And the way we kind of go about it is uh, we have a massive uh, kind of level of freedom to work within the studio. Uh, we basically, we give like a wide breadth of uh, trust and responsibility all around the block. We don't do any kind of performance reviews per se. We basically tell every one of our employees that whatever you want to do, we will basically help you do that. So if, if as a game programmer, you've always felt that I actually want to be an animator, we'll help you, we'll help you get there. But we won't kind of tell you like what your career is going to be five years on from now. Like we help you figure it out, but we are not pushing you into any specific tracks. So that's kind of in a nutshell, nutshell what we do. Uh, so the challenge in the current uh, mobile market space is quite obvious. Like, how do you break through? There's like hundreds of games released every single day. And it doesn't help that you just create a really, 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 really good game these days. Like, that's only half the battle nowadays, because you have to take into the account the marketing. And obviously, you might be the single magical unicorn. So you make a really good game, and it becomes viral. But it's the statistical chance for that is quite small. So we, we didn't try that. We didn't trust that kind of that, that magic. Uh, but yeah, who knows, you might be one. Uh, so hopefully this presentation kind of gives you ideas like may, maybe you have your game already and you're kind of trying to think like how do you market it? Or maybe you are thinking about finding a game studio with your good group of friends and you kind of think about like what should be the stepping stones be like where should we start? Uh, so yeah, maybe this maybe this helps you a bit. Uh, so we we started with the two things. So we are creating a game, but we are also creating a brand and an IP. And both of those are two different things, and both of them require like a, quite a lot of work. And especially being a small startup with few people, it feels like an enormous undertaking. So the thing is you kind of have to think forward quite a lot because that will pay dividends later on. So, and it also helps immensely to have that kind of mission. So it's not just about like we are making games, but you have that kind of grander vision because the games can change, like genres change, games change a lot. But if you have that kind of overarching mission, it makes the work for the studio so much better because everyone still knows like what direction to go, like when we are creating games within this uh, brand and IP. So we, we started with more than just game mechanics. So we had the so-called four C's, character, context, conflict and comedy. Like how do we integrate that into the brand and into the game? And from that we started developing the so-called world of minutia. 
we, we have a really talented lead character artist called Miguel Francisco, who's an OG Barcelona guy. He used to be in the comics industry here and do a lot of advertising and so forth. And he's the guy who created the visual look for Angry Birds back in the day. Uh, so he's, he's our lead character guy. And obviously the challenge with character creation is how do you create characters that have that thing in them that makes it yours, that it's not like a Disney character, or it's not an Angry Bird or something like that. You kinda, it, it, it takes a long time to get there. So we've, we've scoured through quite a lot of like visual design, playing with the negative and positive space across our character cast. Uh, also the so-called enemies in Best Fiends, which are slugs, their, that idea essentially came from real life, so we like to farm our plots of land in Finland. And our nuisance is the slugs that every summer they come to your field and they eat everything bare. And that's absolutely horrendous. So that made a good kind of solution for our, like what is the opposition and what is their driving motivation. And also finding the different characteristics of your, of your slug uh, opponents. Uh, so creating the protagonists, antagonists, and then kind of going on from there in the world building, we essentially go to the world of Minutia. So Minutia is your typical fantasy land, at least it used to be. Uh, everything, is, everything is peaceful, everything is har harmonious. You have these bugs that coexist there. So there's ladybugs ladybugging and spiders spidering and mites miting. Until one day, a giant meteor arcs across the sky and hits a mountain or a dormant volcano called Mount Boom. And there are two things that happen here, like Mount Boom awakens, but we haven't really gotten into what that means yet. But also the slugs that inhabit Mount Boom become massively corrupted, they grow up and they go on a massive uh, devouring spree across Minusia and they essentially eat everything on their path. Like if it looks like edible, you should take a bite just to be sure. So that's, that's their driving motivation. There is, a, there is a head honcho called the Slug King who lives in Mount Boom who has very elaborate plans. But the problem is that you might have elaborate plans, but if your underlings are as stupid as a boot, your intentions and then the actual action, what happens, for, through your commands, it becomes quite muddled. So that's part of where the humor comes from. You might have a really, really smart bad guy, but it doesn't help if your underlings are all like stupid. So after the initial attack, all that is left is a handful of these fiends. I'll get back to that later, like why do we call it that? Who essentially must kind of go on a journey of growing up and finding out like where does this thing gonna, where does this problem arise from? Can we go to Mount Boom and cure the situation? And can we, can we cure the slugs somehow? And they set across to travel across Mount Boom. So uh, Best Fiends was released late 2014, so it was about seven months of work with seven people. It was still quite easy back in the day, and even, well, is, is that really back in the day? Because it was like three years ago, so not, not, not really. Uh, we have about two million daily, daily active players, uh, 70 million uh, plus USD grossing. It's already kind of going towards the 100, so that's a good milestone for us, and around six to five million downloads to date. Uh, so our market approach, this is, this is like a kind of what we kind of puzzled on for a while. So when you kind of create this IP and brand, you can obviously take the position that you, you find the game mechanic that kind of works for you and it kind of works for your audience as well. So who is actually like, imagine that you have this brand and this IP that you're kind of putting work towards. So what is the first game like? Like who is the audience that you're kind of after? And that actually, this affects it quite a lot. So 
initially, like obviously, like match trees and line matching, it's as a game mechanic, it's very understandable, and it's like we we intentionally went for the casual audience, and that's a that's a good mechanic. But obviously, it is just a mechanic, so it kind of needs the meat around it. Like, what is that match tree line matching actually going for? And another thing was that we the, all these games here are like they're uh, immensely respectable. But it also they have that kind of bit of an issue that uh, there's been attempts in like branding it further. But it's really hard to brand it further if you haven't really thought about initially like what that would actually mean. So it's really hard to kind of create that IBM branding like later on if you haven't thought about it initially. So our approach to the whole branding was that we kind of tried to get this sweet but subversive sign into it. So have it be approachable, but have a bit of an edge for it. Because we intended that the game is playable for families, like adults and kids alike, but then the adults would kind of appreciate some of the slightly darker tones that we have in the game. And also we, we called our characters fiends as a kind of general grouping term, because they have this kind of slightly, they have their sharp teeth and so forth. And they have like slightly interesting character backstories. So for example, Temper or might in the in, in above uh, his his parents were killed in a very fortunate uh, unfortunate cowtail accident back in the day. So his coping mechanism is to just pretend that he's a superhero and kind of guard himself like that. And all his friends basically think that he's a bit of a screw loose. So, but eventually he does make it work. Then we have Jojo the butterfly, who's um, uh, one kind of it's a bit of a pro and con but his emotions are kind of visible on her uh, wings. So whatever, if you, if you hide, your, hide your emotions, your wings and the eyes there will actually show what you are truly feeling. So it does create kind of interesting playground in any possible like IP development we do further. Uh, then some of our friends essentially kind of pointed out as the game was developing that, hey, wait a minute, like this is actually, it's 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 Wooga's Jelly Splash uh, married with uh, Puzzle and Dragons, which we kind of realized that okay, so actually I think that's that's not too far. We didn't really think about it that way, but it's you, you basically you play from level to level, you select your group of fiends, and you line a match uh, to create uh, complete those puzzles, and your fiends are fiends are helping you there. Uh, but you are also fighting against the slugs as you progress through the levels and you uh, evolve over your fiends to grow, basically grow into adulthood. So the problem for a startup is that you are typically like six, seven people. So you have all these ideas, but you have to kill your children. Like you are killing all these ideas left and right. And we wanted to make sure that we kind of retain some of the initial core that we have and we find some kind of an afterburner for us to help us with this development. So we focus on what is essential, which is like shipping the game, but then we get outside help in helping to kind of shape the land and shape the branding. So we worked with a Boston-based uh, studio called Pilot. Uh, they basically worked with the, all the Star Wars stuff since the, um, 2000 and a lot of branding for big, big brands and stuff. But those guys are by heart, they are comic artists. So this was a good opportunity for them to kind of just help us a bit and kind of shape us the world and shape the IP and brand development. So it's, a, it's good to find your afterburners. Then any big brand has a, or typically has like a really good theme music and we love uh, movie soundtracks and so forth. So we founded uh, Heitor Pereira, who's uh, one of the composers of the Hans Zimmer Studios. And he, he composed the main theme for Best Fiends. And it's been since played by all these orchestras that go around the world and play game music. But he's done the soundtracks for Despicable Me and Minions and Angry Birds movie. And back in the day, he was in Simply Red as well. So it's, that was also a good sign that once we heard the initial theme that he had played, we all started kind of whistling that in the studio. So it kind of showed that it does stick and it does kind of create, create a good kind of feeling and memory. And so it, this, this all goes into the brand building. We're, there's, there's a few of us in seriously who've always been big fans of Kid Robot. Kid Robot does this very limited edition collectible uh, statues and plushes and stuff. 
and we kind of wanted to do that as well. My, my favorite is that the, the slugs in the bottom middle, so the regular run is the black slugs that you see, but there's like these super rare ones which are like glow in the dark green. And that's what I personally always love about collectibles, that you find the really rare items. Uh, this has nothing to do with uh, kind of making massive amount of money through figures and stuff. You can buy these from Amazon, but this is more about brand recognition and the kind of connections that this can create to you. Because there are people out there who can see that, okay, so Seriously is working with Kid Robot and they know Kid Robot really well, but they don't know Seriously. So now, like if Seriously are working with Kid Robot, then it kind of creates these nice, interesting uh, networks. So the creative marketing side. So apart from making games, what do we focus on? And this is, this is something the where we kind of, we got a bit of a head start back in the day. So if you think about it on mobile side of things, the cost per install is always growing and it does squeeze out a lot of people. So it's really hard to compete uh, when you have a lot of big guys spending tens of millions of dollars on marketing and kind of performance marketing. And our thinking was that Nah, we don't really want to play, play that game. So maybe when we found it seriously, we asked around like, okay, so how's your marketing? Like what works and what doesn't? And uh, a lot of people told us that, well, don't do YouTube. It's a complete sink. It's, it's, it's a waste of time. So then we thought that, yeah, we, we really need to do YouTube. Then let's, let's, let's try it out. So, so uh, what we do, essentially is uh, our traditional user acquisition is a bit of a defensive strategy, but we spend quite a lot on uh, YouTube marketing and this kind of creative marketing. And we've done a lot since like within the past three years. So we initially started with, uh, we hooked up with uh, Malaria No More. So we did like an in-game integration that you can actually donate to Malaria No More through IAPs in our game. and. They've, they've, they've since they are on the cusp of actually eliminating malaria. Uh, then we worked with PewDiePie initially when the game launched and there was this interesting happy accident that obviously PewDiePie uh, pronounced the game's name wrong. So he said best friends. And then if you imagine that you're like a Nike or Adidas or something and then your YouTube star pronounces it Nike and Adidas, then, it, then you might as well can the whole footage. But then we just decided that now nah, let's let's just let it roll. Like let's see what happens. And he became so ashamed of the fact that he, he had gotten the name wrong that he then spent the few days after that just tweeting and doing new videos and apologizing profusely. So we actually got way more than we actually bargained for in terms of like the visibility. So so that helped as well. Then we typically spend about ten percent, five ten percent in the just trying things that are stuff that no one else has tried. So the Norwich football team got kicked out of the Premier League a few years ago and they, uh, in 2015, they actually made it back there. And through a few happy coincidences, they actually had a sponsorship slot there. So then we wondered like, okay, so does it have any traction if, you, if, if an app sponsors a Premier League football team? Like what happens? So then we, then we did that. So we had, we had best fins all over the place. The end result was okay, could have been better, but it was still like an interesting test. And we've since then, we've worked uh, like part of our DNA is the just charity work as well. So we've done a lot for like, we worked with Apple on the apps for Earth. Then we had uh, uh, Rosanna Panciano, who's, who we worked with quite a lot. Uh, we had uh, uh, Ariana Grande on the Apps for Earth. We did Justin Bieber on the Red Campaign. Uh, then it's also important to realize that uh, you are creating games and the people who play it probably like playing games. But who are the people who are interested in the things that your players are interested in, but they are not yet playing your game? Richard Bartle was just here talking about the people who don't play games. So what we do is uh, we, we do look quite a lot into like what do our players like apart from best fiends and then f find like can we find players from those, those uh, places. So we worked with some YouTube stars called like Bratali and Cute Girl Hairstyles and stuff like that. 
which has nothing to do with games, but you actually might find a lot of players from that avenue because they are kind of inclined to like the same things as our players are because they have a shared interest. Then also like we, our game skews slightly towards female, so one big thing is uh, we worked with Kate Walsh, who is playing Dr. Addison on Grey's Anatomy and is really, really well known. So he was on our Don't Download Best Fiends campaign, which was like, that was a really huge campaign because it actually ended up being in the top 10 most viewed like clips in YouTube and we got this massive like award from that. And we were there amongst all these huge advertisers and that was basically like an India production on our, on our scale. We have a really good video team that's, that's very experienced, so we didn't really work through like agencies and stuff. Uh, so then our campaigns. So the typical thing in game industry is that your marketing team hates your development team and your development team hates your marketing team and they don't understand each other and why are they screwing us off and god damn it, this is not how it was supposed to be and so forth and so forth. So because we've been there and we know that, then we decided that, okay, so let's, let's make this work. So what do we do? So one of the things we did was uh, this mobile treasure hunt. So we had uh, about 13 or so YouTubers with like a massive amount of uh, subscribers and they basically placed stickers all around our game and then our players went after that to find those stickers. And it's part of it is driven just by the gameplay, but then part of it is driven by the fact that you really like those YouTube stars. So it's kind of like, a, it's kinda like a, it goes both ways. And we amplified that with some TV advertisement and Twitter and so forth. So the thing that worked for us was that our, uh, the DAU grew, grew quite nicely and baseline downloads got a nice boost and then our social media platform which we are building is that grew up. So that, that told us that okay, so it is actually validating what we are doing here. Then another one. So what we did was, this was probably the biggest charity campaign ever for a while, like in games at least. So this was our second Christmas race against Slime, where we essentially teamed up with about 10 different charities or so, and we had this 120,000 USD prize pool. And as a player, when you go into the game, you can basically pledge yourself two ways. So you can either like the charities, or you can pledge yourself to the YouTubers who have chosen these charities. So for example, we had a Markiplier who, who wanted to play for Cincinnati Children's Hospital. So as a player, you might decide that, oh yeah, I like Cincinnati Children's Hospital, or I, I like Markiplier, but I'm gonna pledge myself to that. And your progress in the game counted towards Cincinnati Children's Hospital's score. And then based on which uh, team got out, out on top, they basically got the biggest amount of the prize pool. And then one surprise we got in the way was that Ellen DeGeneres actually promised that if, we, if the players defeat like 100 million slugs, which was the score, uh, he would double the prize pool. So that was kind of a good one. And we don't, like when we work, work with YouTube stars, we don't really give them any direction on what they can do because that creates, it's like they can do what they feel like is on, like what works for them. So Markiplier uh, did an interesting thing. Race Against Slime 2, the world's biggest mobile charity race is financed by Seriously. Damn. Uh. Friends, we fight for charity, yeah. and I'm fighting 
half of the Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh. We will, we will see who supports you by who clicks the link in the description yeah. section below and who visits the Best Fiends Facebook page to check the star. Yeah. If me and my team can beat the holiday levels by December 23rd, Best Fiends will double the amount of slugs for my charity. Mark, it's Alan. I just wanted to let you know that if you and your team can kill 100 million slugs by December 23rd, I will double the charity money. Really? Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I can do this! So, as a lesson from YouTube marketing, like here's a good example, this is from Germany. So all, the, all of those spikes that you see initially is more like traditional user acquisition. So you put in money, you buy players in, they might not be good quality players and then they drop out and then you do it again. That's, that's a very traditional shape for a lot of developers. And then when you see that flat line sort of appearing like after mid, that's, a, that's, a, that's YouTuber marketing for us. Uh, then we essentially took that and took it to uh, US on the Mother's Day and that kind of showed us the similar thing. So it essentially means that uh, it's a, you can get really highly efficient with your customer acquisition through YouTube or if you kind of like, you just need to kind of get the pulse on who are the people to kind of do this with, who are kind of aligned with your brand and so forth. Uh, so for us, this essentially means that the, the differ differentiated marketing does cut through. So you you should kind of you focus on the creative marketing rather than just outspending everyone else on the user acquisition market because that is like even even guys at Supercell are like looking at it and like it's 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 a horrible market. It's like you can it is you can even say that the more money you're gonna sink in, the more you are actually losing. Uh, we, as you kind of saw on the videos, we integrate the product and marketing campaigns quite heavily. So it's not that we, we have a group over there who does marketing and then we have developers here. They are in constant contact with each other through Slack. Uh, hello? Oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, and then obviously uh, the YouTube influencers do cut through. So whenever you are like, for example, the apps on Earth, Earth uh, campaign uh, with Rosanna Panciano and uh, Ariana Grande, like when it's when the endorsement is authentic, it does drive downloads quite well. Uh, oops, sorry, let's pause that a bit. So once you kind of get, like we no longer need runway, so we are profitable and we're happy, so we're, we're on the air. So once you kind of get into this point, you can start kind of expanding your brand and the IP. And this is one of the things we just did, and there's more coming this autumn. Roger! First day of boot camp! Uh-huh. It's finally here! I know. It's now! Attention! It's fantastic! Yep. We are at war with the greatest threat ever to slug kind. The bees! <sighs> These slimeless insects are intent on stopping our domination of Minutia. And our only defense is to send wave after wave of you to get pummeled! What are you slugs waiting for? Ah! <clears throat> Step right up, boys! Don't be scared! I got this! I got this! Oh, move it! Move it! Yeah! <laughs> Whoops. That's the way to do it. Now, some of you might not have what it takes to join my slug army, but you will be recruited anyway, because that's the way my army works. I don't know, but I've been told. I don't know, but I've been told. None of us will live to be old. None of us will live to be old. Sound off. Uh -oh. That was close. Ooh, anybody know who that was? 
He's the first of you to fail, but certainly not the last. Yeah, didn't get his name. We slugs have never won, and we'll never win a war. Why? Because we're slugs, and we expect you to carry on that fine tradition. Easy, oh, yeah. easy. Yes. No, don't dodge the punches, maggot. That's not how we do things. Slug, yes, slug. Phew. Oh, perfect. Congratulations, slugs! It's time for you to get out there and show those fiends what we're made of! <laughs> and now, for some inspiring words from your Commander-in-Chief! Roger, Roger! The Slug King! I heard he eats fiends for breakfast. <laughs> this is a day that you'll remember for the rest of your very short Lives. <laughs> Fiends? Slugs, prepare for battle! <laughs> Let's go! <laughs> Take that! Yeah, that's gonna stay. <laughs> that's gonna need a band-aid. <laughs> and time to go. <laughs> oh, I told you this was a horrible idea. Huh? So I'm catching up on the timetable a bit here. So takeaways, <coughs> uh, IBM brand developer, if you do it early on, it's way easier to expand on that later because it's, you, you're, not, you're not building on this card house that kinda can topple, but you have a big, big, big brand, you've thought about it long term, and it's really easy to kinda expand games of different genre. Our idea is not to do like, line matchers forever, but we, we have games under development on the same IP and brand that just utilize different genres of games. Uh, you need to know your player base, like I know we're all very inclined to do games for gamers and so forth, but you really, at honestly, you need to look at like who is your audience, who does your audience end up being. Uh, do the right thing, most of the games I worked for always kind of strive to teach the player something about some real life things or then there's some kind of a charity component there. And for us, it's been like a massively good kind of tie up because people like playing games and if you can tie charity work into that, then it's actually amazing like what can happen. And then finally, the game must come first because we're in the game development business. And for us, the th thesis of fun, simple and sticky are the most important ones with the stickiness especially meaning that when your game is ready, you give it out to your friends and the response should be that they won't give your phone back until you ask. And that's a really good metric for all of it. And that was the metric for best fiends and that's kind of clued us on our way. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. And I am around, so please, questions if you have any. Cheers. <laughs>